renowned courses nowadays in the last year actually globally and I follow different webinars and no one has been committed to online education on the professional development of orthopedic surgeons all over the world as much as you are and that's uh, really impressive and astounding to see. So thank you for the lovely introduction and today I'm going uh, without further ado to talk about uh, shoulder uh, uh, reverse uh, shoulder replacement. We're going to talk about history and the present advances, complications and tips and tricks in, in order to avoid these complications. So in this, uh, <clears throat> in the next uh, 40 minutes or so, I'm going to talk about uh, what do we know about shoulder replacements, the history of shoulder, uh, reverse shoulder replacements, what are the outcomes of, uh, what are the outcomes and what is the available uh, evidence? And uh, we, we have to be, uh, and uh, we, there are a few questions that we will aim to answer by the end of uh, this uh, lecture. So, uh, so first, you know, which type of shoulder, uh, reverse shoulder replacement do you use in your hospital is based on different factors. This includes uh, what type of hospital do you work in, what sort of uh, replacements are there, and what do hospital managers uh, recommend, and that's a thing we have in the UK and also in many European uh, countries, as well as the US uh, cost-effective shoulder replacements and, shoulder, uh, and uh, shoulder surgery. The other variable which shouldn't affect your decision is what companies are telling us. So, what, so every company would try to sell the reverse shoulder replacement, but actually uh, there is science behind uh, these uh, very successful which, uh, replacements, which is getting popular uh, day after day. So let's go quickly about uh, to talk about the rotator cuff function. So the rotator cuff has actually the pumping action, which is uh, with a medial force and an inferior force, you have a net force that would create a fulcrum between the humeral head and the glenoid, putting the deltoid at a biomechanical uh, advantage of firing, and so would initiate elevation. And this uh, biomechanical advantage of the cuff is gone rotator cuff arthropathy in the case of reverse shoulder replace, uh, in the case of rotator cuff arthropathy, uh, in the case of irreversible cuff uh, tears. And that would ultimately lead to glenohumeral arthropathy and proximal migration of the humeral head. So we, there are different classifications and different variations, possibly for, for rotator cuff arthropathy. The most uh, commonly used, uh, for example, purposes, and actually in clinical practice is the Hamada classification, uh, with, with grades one and two mainly dependent on the acromial humeral distance. And then you, we start to observe in, in stage three proximal migration, followed by decreased glenohumeral uh, joint and then finally collapse of the humeral head. So what do I do when I see a patient with a repairable cuff? First, if there is arthritis or not, that's a great question you have to ask yourself. Always physical therapy helps in these patients and that's something we have to keep in mind. Until your detoid strengthening and exercises are still the mainstay. Recent evidence now supports uh, kinetic change, uh, kinetic chain concept and improving the power in the hip and glutes would enable the patient to undertake proper shoulder function. Other options in the case, so if there is no arthritis would be SCR or superior capsule reconstruction or tendon transfers, either left or thigh or here lower trapezius and finally arthroplasty. And arthroplasty in, the, in this case would be either a hemi arthroplasty or a reverse shoulder replacement. And this uh, presentation will be focusing more on reverse shoulder replacement. So let's see how shoulder replacements developed over the years. The first introduction of such implants was by Charles Neer. However, the problem here of damaged or absent periarticular structure remained unresolved then semi-constrained or constrained processes was tested. And the problem in patients with irreparable cuff with the near processes 
there was high failure rate. And many investigators over the years thought about restoration of the center of rotation. The first actual shoulder arthroplasty was performed in 1893 by a surgeon in France called Jules Pian on a 37 years old baker. And then there was many designs proposed over the years looking at establishing a center of rotation that stabilized. And that many, many have worked and have thought about how can you improve the stability of your processes in case of deficient cuff. And we can see here a lot of uh, these replacements uh, ranging from the pile and uh, other, uh, other replacements inspired by the successful hip replacements. However, all these failed because of the progressive and excessive torque and shear forces at the glenoid component bone interface. And that was the main problem that many did not realize over the years. Up till this man, one of uh, the most inspiring and efficient uh, shoulder surgeons uh, in uh, history of shoulder replacement, Professor Paul Marie Gramont, who uh, with uh, to the help of two engineers looked at the mathematical approach in, uh, in, uh, in establishing the concept of a reverse shoulder replacement in patients with when the cuff is absent. And his idea was in the, to intrinsically balance the middle deltoid to strengthen its abduction component and lessen the elevation component responsible for the loosening strength, uh, sorry, the loosening stress on the glenoid. Moreover, he said that medializing the center of rotation of the scapulohumeral joint and the increasing that will increase the deltoid liver arm. So the basic concepts of the Gramont style was having a medialized center of rotation, distalization of humerus, which will ultimately lead to decreased shear forces and a greater liver arm on the deltoid. Looking at that concept, he thought that the lack of activity of the supraspinatus muscle, you medialize the center of rotation compared with the previous models. And if you do so, you increase the lever arm. Give, uh, when the deltoid come in function, as in this picture here, you can see that the deltoid is lengthened and that would create an ad biomechanical advantage would, would, which would enable the medial, middle fibers of the deltoid by increased lever arm to undertake the job properly. So he medialized, uh, so the, uh, it's a problem here, so what he really realized, because others have thought about that, but if you medialize the humerus itself, the deltoid liver arm will remain unchanged instead of being increased. So in a first step, you lower the center of rotation, you medialize the center of rotation, then the deltoid will work at a superior biomechanical advantage, which would enable the deltoid to function and uh, undertake the job uh, properly. So we're going to talk about the clinical aspects now, which is the most uh, more interesting bits. So the indications of uh, reverse shoulder replacement, uh, most common indication is still cuff arthropathy. Uh, a repairable cuff repair with early arthritis is another option. Uh, complex humor fractures, as we all know, patients with poor uh, rotator cuff quality like rheumatoid arthritis. If I see someone with rheumatoid arthritis and I'm going to operate on their shoulder, I'll offer them a, shoulder, a reverse shoulder replacement because I know the cuff will fail eventually. If you have retroverted glenoid as a revision option and tumor surgery. And uh, here you can see rotator cuff arthropathy is the commonest of what we do. And you, uh, you, you can see an advanced rotator cuff arthropathy. There is acetabularization of uh, the acromion, femoralization of the humeral head. You see massive tear, ecstatic changes here. And uh, of course, the only indication for uh, the only option I have for these patients would be surgical option, of course, would be a reverse shoulder replacement. So proximal humeral fractures, very good, a very uh, 
bulky part of my practice. I was telling Prof. Muhammad and Dr. Karim that we're actually having two to uh, having two to do next week. So, and we also during my fellowship with Christian and Professor Gerber, we looked at the, the outcomes of salvage repair shoulder arthroplasty for failed operative treatment of proximal humerus and under the age of 16. And we looked as well, then we published our results of uh, out of 159 repair shoulder replacements. And it is a very reliable option with, with satisfactory, if not very good, excellent uh, outcomes compared with reverses in unreconstructable uh, proximal humeral fractures like these. Uh, in that study, we looked at uh, the outcomes in, above, uh, in patients with younger than 60 years. We found if, if actually, if you're going, if you have someone with an irreparable or unfixable proximal humerus, it might be better to opt for a reverse. And if you go for, uh, for fixation, you, and you have to revise them with a revision or surplus, you have to warn these patients that there is a high complication rate. However, overall, it remains a very uh, successful option to offer for all our patients. It's, of course, revision or subplasty is still an indication to go for a, a reverse shoulder replacement. And uh, with complications and infections and other complications, we should consider other options. So what are the contraindications? There are absolute contraindications. Uh, which I think active infection is the main contraindication. Deltoid deficiency is a contraindication, unless I, when I visited uh, Bassem Al Hassan in uh, Mayo Clinic, he still do tendon transfers with a reverse shoulder replacement, but I would still say that these are the main contraindications for reverse shoulder replacement. Acromial deficiency is another contraindication. Os acromiali is not a contraindication for a shoulder replacement. Illinois osteoporosis is also a contraindication, but not really. And it is common to perform these procedures on these patients. So preoperative planning, let's go to prepare patients for theaters. Uh, clinical, clinical, clinical is crucial. You have to assess these patients. You have to approach them using the cluster method, diagnostic cluster. So combination of history, examination, investigation, and special tests. I have patients refer to me for a shoulder replacement and they have arthritis. Their main problems was, was in the neck and actually going for a shoulder replacement wouldn't cause any improvement in their symptoms. So you have to assess these patients properly. Uh, X-rays is crucial as well. And of course, I don't have to remind you that X-rays is an important part. I would never operate on anyone for, uh, with, uh, for uh, I wouldn't do a reverse shoulder uh, replacement without uh, a CT scan. CT scans is important to identify the virgin bony defect, whether you need to prepare certain implants. We wrote uh, this paper uh, for bone and joint a uh, couple of years ago, uh, and we popularized the ellipse method, which was a modification for measuring glenoid version, and that's what I tend to do. We proposed five-step uh, ellipse method, which is a uh, 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 it's actually a modification from uh, for uh, for the Friedman method, and it's mainly defining a circle on the cuts, defining the center of uh, a rotation and that would enable you to measure the version and this is important because that's usually the most challenge is a high most challenging part whenever you're undertaking your reverse shoulder replacement so i do ct scans if needed i'll do an mri scan i wouldn't do an mri scan routinely and uh, what we have nowadays actually there are uh, multiple systems and multiple pre-operative uh, programs and software that enable you to identify the right implant and the right version and the right components to use. And many of them, big companies who are undertaking shoulder replacements nowadays are uh, having uh, similar softwares. And this is really important to play. I wouldn't uh, plan every, uh, all of them by the, uh, all of them. Uh, for every case, but actually I would plan those who I think there are challenging ones. I've sent a patient to a, for a CT scan now, and uh, uh, this week, who well, I think she had a 
fracture, the, the, so had the fracture dislocation. I'm worried about the glenoid. And for that patient, the only option for her, because it's her own uh, dislocation, the only option for her would be a pro uh, proper planning and possibly a bespoke components, which we'll talk about. And then you take these patients to theaters. Uh, Approach-wise, we only have two approaches, the Navizier uh, McKinsey approach or the supralateral approach or the deltopectoral approach. I personally prefer the deltopectoral approach. It is a workhorse of uh, replacement surgery. It is an extensile approach. It enables you to undertake revisions easily and avoid the increased risk of axillary nerve injury in the supralateral approach. And then this is a video about the deltopectoral approach uh, briefly, which I know many of the audience are confident doing uh, it. And uh, so these are the three sisters. You identify the three sisters. Sorry, the resolution isn't great for uh, that video. But what I tend to do after identification of the great uh, the three sisters, you then excise uh, person uh, identifies the long head of biceps, which is next to the pec major. You can release the pec major distally. This video is not mine. It is uh, by uh, Professor Walsh from uh, France, which is the same technique I would use personally because that's what uh, uh, I would use in any of my replacements. You identify the upper border of the subscap, and then you take stay stitches in the subscap. Always release the space below the deltoid and create subdeltoid bursa. And then after identification of the subscap, there are different concepts and different techniques of how to do it. For younger uh, patients, uh, if I'm doing anatomic mail, I'll do an osteotomy or a peel. And uh, for older patients, you can uh, just cut the, release the subscap. It's always crucial to release the subscap and do your releases at this stage, which will enable you and make life easier later on. I tend to release the pec here as uh, for a bit of uh, the pec, in, especially with advanced arthritis. Always, always uh, like it the three sisters prior to reaching this uh, stage. And all the releases should be done here. Spend, take your time. It doesn't take long, but it will save you time later on. And then uh, after uh, releasing the subscap, you can uh, push the subscap uh, under the coracoid. I, after also, you have to identify the, the glenohumeral ligament, and you can uh, release it, uh, spend some time in order to achieve uh, this. If this, if you can, uh, I would spend as much time as I need here in order to have a proper approach to the shoulder. Now the subscap is released and you can push it uh, uh, because that will actually protect your axillary nerve because the axillary nerve was on the other side. I don't tend to dig for it. You can hear this is a nice trick uh, that we tend to do. Put the uh, human on the anterior, uh, pro anterior uh, glenoid and then do your releases. Up till now, the head is still intact. I haven't taken any of, uh, we did, uh, there is no osteotomy done yet. And proper release, 360 release would be indicated and especially inferior release is important. Another advantage of the glen deltopectoral approach compared with supralateral or navizier uh, uh, McKinsey approach is that you can do proper release of the inferior glenoid using the deltopectoral approach. So what, uh, what do we know about uh, reverses? So Gramont design was a brilliant design. As I said, he was an inspired, he, he, he's actually the most influential shoulder arthroplasty surgeon. And uh, his uh, ideas was uh, foundation for a lot of ideas consequently. The problem with uh, Cramont designs that we've discussed earlier is that with uh, this concept, you have four problems. Increased risk of notching, we'll go through that in details. Problems with rotation, problems with instability and lengthening. And there has been multiple publications in that regard. And we know that uh, notching and the uh, limitation of rotation has been significant in the earlier design. And stability, also popular, uh, still a problem in all reverse shoulder replacements, but it was more pronounced in that design. And the arm lengthening have caused, uh, have also been a concern. So this is Frankel, uh, a US uh, shoulder surgeon who 
actually was the first one who thought about lateralizing the center of rotation a bit more, not as much as the previous uh, designs, but actually almost to normal, uh, uh, almost he actually, the center of rotation uh, in the in-core uh, processes that Frankel has uh, proposed uh, in 1998, it was placed less medially than the Delta, which is the trumpet uh, design by, uh, by uh, Gramont, and the center of rotation was actually closer to its usual anatomic location and so in the and then many surgeons have started to think about how to have more lateralization how you can achieve more lateralization and that actually uh, can be achieved either through the glenoid side or the humeral uh, side and uh, glenoid lateralization you can do it either metallic lateralization by having increased metal offset or biological, which is bio-RSA, which will go through it uh, at the end of this presentation. And uh, as the, the, the idea was having more lateralized center of rotation might yield to better outcomes. We'll go through the evidence as well. The other way of lateralizing your center of rotation is actually to do that through the humerus, because we know humerus is easier to work on compared to the glenoid. So you can decrease the deck shaft angle, you can use a curved stem or you can use an eccentric tray. So with glenoid lateralization, we've talked about metallic and biologic. The other problem with this is that you might increase the force applied to the glenoid component, which was a problem with the earlier designs I've shown, I've, I've demonstrated in the video earlier in the presentation. So different concepts, different designs, different components, and now we have more and more components and multi-platforms all aiming to increase uh, the outcome. So which one to use and what are the concerns of each? Let's go through it. So with glenoid lateralization, the advantages here, you achieve lost notching. We'll talk about notching in details. We achieve better rotation and we achieve better shoulder contour. With, uh, this is asso associated with less instability. With the disadvantages here that these patients might have theoretically less abduction, although that's not really true all the time, and glenoid loosening. The same problem of limited abduction can be, so it can be noticed in humerus lateralization. Having said that, the main disadvantage of glenoid lateralization is glenoid loosening, no longer a problem here. And with humeral lateralization, you have better rotation, less arm lengthening and less notching, uh, notching and better shoulder contour. So what are the complications then that I keep talking about over this presentation? Let's go one by one. It, it is impressive that in this publication many years ago, it was mentioned that a shoulder, reverse shoulder replacement is associated with 15% complication rate. But in this paper, there is a big worry and concern that the majority of the surgeons were before, sorry, the majority of surgeries were performed by surgeons who does annually two or less in a year, which I think if you're doing that limited number of shoulder replacements, you shouldn't be doing them. And we should have a centralized hub, which what is being aimed in the UK now, because the more you do, the better you are. So what are the general complications? And there are specific complications. So general complications of any shoulder arthroplasty include infection, instability, fraction, nerve injury, VTE problems, deltoid, dysfunction, hematoma, and loosening. For anatomics, the main problem is rotator cuff dysfunction and glenoid loosening. For hemi, glenoid erosion and rotator cuff dysfunction. What about reverse, the topic of interest? We'll go through them one by one. So we looked at uh, 159, uh, 159 reverses from different centers across uh, the UK and Europe. And we found in this uh, cohort two axial nerve palsy, four hematoma formation, one acromial fracture, which was managed non-operatively, four periprosthetic fractures, which was managed with the circulation intraoperatively, none of them needed revision. And out of this cohort, there was uh, six revision cases. One, uh, two of them, uh, actually three of them because of glenoid loosening and two of them because of humeral loosening and one because of instability. 
So what about the main complication that we all worried about? And we'll talk about that for some time. Infection is a concern. It is 1% of primary total and 5% around primary reverse. So that's what I tell my patients when I'm consenting them. Why reverse has a slightly higher complication rate of infection? Because one, is it's a large dead space. Two, there is no living soft tissue as a cough. These patients are usually older, might be immunocompromised and have multiple comorbidities. And mostly these patients have multiple previous surgeries and in most orthopedic procedures, that's a risk of infection. We know uh, these organisms are the commonest that cause infection. P. acne has been popularized by my friend and colleague Ali Narvani many years ago, and many studies have been published since then looking at this um, main uh, bacteria, which is a gram-positive non-spore forming bacteria. Uh, the problem we have with very prosthetic joint infections in the shoulder is summarized in this paper. The majority of these patients with actual true infection do not present with overt signs of infection. The inflammatory markers are normal in the majority of time, and the negative, there is negative evidence of acute inflammation in intraoperative histological specimens in 92%. And that was a paper published by Topolsky in 2006. And so, you don't have to prove it's infected. If you're suspecting an infection, I have very low threshold to go in and deprive them. So how do I manage this? As this is a very good classification that helps in identifying and managing these problems. If there is positive cultures in the main time of surgery, I'll give organism specific antibiotics and close clinical observation if it is a, a revision. If it is acute in 30 days, so their approach would be the best approach, which is deprivement and retention of processes, possibly change of insert. If there is acute hematological spread in 30 days, if it is actually less than two months, you can manage it as before. If it is more than 30 days or chronic infection as in type four, I'll do a two-stage revision more than two to three months apart. Uh, we, this, uh, Christian Gerber is one of the most influential uh, shoulder surgeons, and we published this paper uh, when I was doing my fellowship with him, look at a very prosthetic shoulder infection, and we found that a spacer is successful in infection control, so two-stage procedure will be successful 90%. Second stage, some patients ended with a spacer, others had uh, only had uh, had the hemi, but the best outcome was achieved when you do a reverse shoulder replacement in the second stage revision. So a common complication that we keep hearing about, and it's very debatable, which is notching. Notching is thought to be a mechanical impingement between the supramedial aspect of the humeral poly insert and the inferior scapular neck. It used to be thought it is a problem with abduction, now there is a new school thought says that it actually happens more with extension and internal rotation. Looking here, you can see what do I mean by that. So if this is a cadaveric model, looking at uh, so when you have extension and internal rotation, there is notching that occurs here. It is actually a friction between the plastic and actually the insert and the inferior scapular neck. So Many publications has been published. It is as common as 90% in previously published papers. This is the most acceptable classification of notching with grade one just in, limited to the pillar here. Grade two reach the lower screw, grade three above the screw, and grade four actually is extend under the base plate, which is important. So does it affect clinical outcomes and does notching affect range of motion? It's we, there are many publications in shoulders looking at that. In uh, this uh, study, they found that it is as common as 88% at 12 years. In our study, we found notching is one third of the patients. We found that their notching uh, was stabilized at two years after surgery and didn't affect the range of motion or the outcomes 
of uh, surgery. In others, which is a longer follow-up, they found actually notching would increase after eight years and notching would cause, ultimately will cause decreased outcomes at nine years. Does, is there clinical relevance of notching? Papers said no, others said there is negative influence. And does it, uh, we still have to do more work about notching, but if you're doing surgery, you have to avoid notching at all costs. How to do that? One, there are different factors that you can do while doing your reverse shoulder replacements that would enable you to avoid notching. This include one, put the sphere to an inferior position, which was popularized by Gerber, which will result in less mechanical impingement and the increased arc of movement. Another option is the inferior tilt. You will never, you're doing your uh, central uh, big aim for the green sphere to be pointing downwards a bit because that would avoid notching, as you can see. Other aspect would be avoid excessive reaming of the glenoid and implant choice. By implant choice, I mean use a lateralized implant, use a bio RSA, which can help avoid notching, basically because this might be actually notching might be in your graft, but it wouldn't happen because you have lateralized center uh, of rotation, as you can see here, or a larger glen sphere radius would also enable you to avoid notching. Decreased neck shaft angle is another thing you can do. Reduction of the cup depth is also another option. And eccentric clean sphere would help. Plus angled insert has the theoretical advantage of avoiding notching. So in order to avoid notching while you're doing surgery, this is a summary of what you need to do by increasing offset, playing with uh, positioning, lateralizing of center of rotation, increasing the radius of the glen sphere and downward inclination of the glenoid component. So another important complications that we see in stability is, uh, sorry, with reverses is instability. With anatomics, there are different size uh, reasons why you can have instability. In reverses, Instability is a big problem. Not a big problem as much as anatomic, and it's decreasing nowadays because we know more uh, how to avoid these. But it has been cited to be as high as one third of shoulder uh, reverse shoulder replacements. As with everything else, we can categorize them into patient, surgical, and design related factors. Patient factors. If the patient has prior surgery, as I've mentioned early, non-compliant patients, recurrent fallers, or those with poor deltoid fun function, I would be worried about doing them. I've done one reverse for someone who had epilepsy when I, well, the only indication was that this patient would have a fit free phase of almost six to 12 months, and then we opted for surgery. Because the worst you can do is your patient having a, a, a fit, and then dislocating the processes. Uh, other surgical factors approach, there are debate, as is, as there are many debates, deltopectoral has been proposed to be causing, uh, to be associated with instability, which has been refuted. Uh, humoral lens discrepancy is a big cause, malposition of component as we all would expect. So you have to preserve the soft tissue envelope and avoid hematoma and dead space and maintain deltoid function. Approach, as I said, some say that there is less instability with suprolateral approach. However, if you, uh, this has been debated by many and with the other risks of the suprolateral approach, I wouldn't opt for doing so. Humoral lens discrepancies is also important, especially when you're revising or in cases of fractures. And risk of placing the humoral component too low in those who have humoral bone loss on those who have complex humeral fractures. Malpositioning, it's not rocket science. You have to do it properly and uh, be meticulous and uh, 
focus on achieving the right orientation. You have to preserve the soft tissue envelopes. This is more important in anatomics than in reversals. And so what about deltoid tension? If you increase the lateral offset, there might be risks of having uh, this would be helpful to we'll talk about the bio RSA in details uh, in the next uh, part of the presentation. And uh, other design factors, lateralized center of rotation is associated with that risk, humerus size and the poly depth is also crucial. How to manage these? So it is crucial to rule out structural abnormalities when you're reviewing these patients. Proximal femur fractures, those who are you revising with base plate fixation failure and those with component malpositioning. We published uh, two steps, uh, two intraoperative uh, maneuvers that you can do that can identify this problem before you start closure. These are actually the bit shuffle test, as you can see here, which is simply pushing on the elbow, see if that's dislocating. If it is, you have to revise. And then the lateral thrust we looked into that in 100 cases, and it's also a crucial uh, step. And plus all what we know with the pitch shuffle test, if there is anthrosuperior translation, you should consider using a larger green sphere or a lateralized human liner. If you have lateral thrust, that's a problem of a lateral dislocation. So you have to have larger green sphere as well with or without lateralization and lateral liner. These are all the tests we keep using, the conjoint tendon tension. Test is also I use most of the time, and of course, plus the abduction, external rotation, and adduction, internal rotation, which gives me an idea about all the range of motion uh, I'm, pro I'm expecting the patient will be doing, and so you can anticipate the problem so that you can manage it. So if, you if, your, shoulder dis uh, if your shoulder comes back with uh, dislocation, First option, and actually first step is to do closed reduction and I'll keep them in a sling for six weeks. And if that problem persists, I would uh, uh, exclude infection all the time, assess other problems like virgin reconstruction of soft tissue envelope or humoral lens discrepancy. Make sure in revisions that I remove the soft tissue inferior to the green sphere because it might be causing impingement and dislocation. And if there is in the revision scenario, humoral lens discrepancy, you have to assess how much discrepancy it is. If it is less than two centimeter, I'll use a large glenosphere and increase the length of the humoral component. If it is greater than two centimeter, I'll revise the humoral component with or without an allograft. Another problem that was a problem more before, but less frequent with modern designs is the base blade failures. Luckily, we don't see much of this common problem is this is mainly related to initial fixation as well as loosening due to osteolysis and the main part here is infection. Uh, it can, you can see them with crew fixation as you can see with crew fixation with pl base plate failure or dissociation between the base plate and the glenoid sphere. Common causes, as I said, loosening, infection, or incomplete seating of the sphere. And that's why when you're doing your shoulder replacement, make sure there is no soft tissue interposition. There is incomplete removal of the peripheral. Make sure you, do, you didn't have, uh, you make, com you, uh, you achieve complete removal of the peripheral limb of bone on the glenoid. And also correct placement of the central screws, as well as maintain your field as clean and dry as possible. Uh, other preventive measures, uh, Holocom uh, wrote uh, the inferior tilt of base plate is, uh, it can help and locking screws, which all components have nowadays. If it fails and all the other options fails, a uh, single, uh, single stage or two stage with or without uh, structure graft is the main option. Periprosthetic fracture, I'll go quickly through this because it's another different topic. Uh, risk there is 1.6 to 2.3, and we are starting now. We do a lot of shoulder replacements. We're starting to see a lot of these. We still manage them non-operatively. Uh, we use the right and co-field classification in determining uh, the best option for uh, type A. This is type B. Type C, where the fracture is distal to the table of processes. So you can see all of them here. And 
prevention is easier than treatment. So as with everything else in this presentation, be extra cautious. Avoid forceful external rotation when you're doing the procedure, excessive reaming of the medullary canal, and always key, be cautious at all times. For type A, if the component is loose, I'll use a strut graft and a long stem. If it is secure, I'll go for plate and circlage or even circlage alone, which I've done, I've done uh, recently. Uh, you can use either soft tissue circlage, which were one proposed by ours, uh, which uh, use the R6 ones, there are others, or uh, metal circlage. For time two, non operative treatment is an option, uh, still an option that I use every now and then, or the same. For type C, you can deal with these as humeral fractures and manage them accordingly, or use a long stem or a strut graft or plate. So also many designs now have short stems or have stemless designs, which theoretically would lead to decreased periprosthetic problems later on. Uh, another fracture that can happen while you're doing the surgery, and this has been reported up to 10%, is glenoid fractures. And always, always, I tell my, the fellows uh, that when we're doing one of these is to start reaming before making contact with the glenoid bone. And uh, when reaming an osteoporotic bone beyond the subchondral bone, that might be a problem because it can catch the unreamed subchondral bone. So this should be avoided. Options, you can redo the central pilot hole into better bone or uh, use base plate screws to stabilize the fracture, which, uh, uh, which is a very valid option, or fixing the fragment with any other screws before doing the base plate placement, or insert a hemi and revise to a reverse when the glenoid is healed. Deltoid dysfunction can, if you injure the axillary nerve, you can leave, this can happen, or it is a catastrophic complication uh, and the, usual, uh, the other problem you can do if you uh, uh, if you position your insert, uh, uh, incision wrongly, you can actually do deltoid muscle detachment. Uh, it's morally surgical. Luckily, it's not very common. Other complications, hematoma, which uh, has been uh, reported to be between one to 20% in, shoulder, in reverse shoulders. Hematoma can be a risk for instability and can be a risk for infection. And so have low threshold to the, in our study, we managed all hematomas non-operatively and we had no complications looking at 159. DVT, another problem. And that's why if you're worried, give your patients anticoagulation prior to the surgery. So what are the advances? I'm almost done now. So uh, uh, RSA which uh, is a biologic uh, reverse shoulder replacement uh, popularized by this man, uh, 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 popularized uh, uh, it, uh, mainly to increase the lateral center of uh, rotation. Uh, by putting a bone graft, you can achieve humoral lateralization or uh, Lateralize, sorry, you, you achieve lateralization of the center of rotation, this type of error. And these are the other techniques you can use to achieve lateralization. With bio RSA, the center of rotation is kept as the glenoid bone processes once the graft has healed, which is a great advantage that would overcome the problems of the lateral as well as the medial. So you still maintain, you lateralize, but you still maintain the center of rotation in a more medialized uh, position. So these are the purported advantages of bio -RSA, and we also did a study that I'll show you our results at the end. Uh, these, are associated, these are the proposed uh, outcomes. Many studies, Polo, Polo who's the uh, one who proposed this uh, the bio RSA uh, or the bony increased offset reverse shoulder arthroplasty. They looked at their studies and they found, looked at different, comparing it to the original medialized uh, processes. Uh, and they found others uh, compared and they found no, no difference in clinical outcomes, but notching was significantly better in bio -RSA. Other study by Krisner, 
he compared the Gramont style to PyORSA, no difference again in, in functional scores, but significant difference in notching rate. And graft was incorporated and healed in all patients. So Grenier from Germany did an RCT, still same uh, observation, no difference between uh, both. Uh, there is slightly better rotation and pony integration was achieved in all. Another study by Colin, they did a retrospective study and they found that actually the bio RSA had improved a range of motion, better function, no difference in rotation, which is contradictory to the previous ones. And no scapular, and they found no different scapular notching, which is, which is what others didn't see. So what we did is we uh, did this uh, meta-analysis, looking at all studies and reanalyzing them. We asked the question, is it associated with better outcomes? We looked at the constant score. We looked at the DASH score. We looked at the American shoulder and elbow score, and we found no difference in clinical outcomes. And then we asked the second question, which is, does it associate, is it associated with better rotation? We found that, yes, it does. But the ranges of movement were wide, and no statistical difference has been found according to our analysis. Is it associated with less notching? We found that, yes, it is associated with less notching. Does the graft heal? And the answer to that is yes. Be the, according to reported evidence, it's up to 100% and as low as 77%. So to summarize, yes, it decreased notching and the graft does heal, but actually better rotation and better outcome scores are debatable. And of course, more research is needed. Finally, we have to think about what, how can we improve? We can improve by now computerized planning. We're doing bespoke implants, patient specific and navigation. A lot of navigation system are, are there. This is a Medacta one, my shoulder, which I use as well, as well as the blueprint. There are different models in the system and it's all about achieving superior anatomic reconstruction challenge it's always challenging on the glenoid side so if i come to into any theater uh, what really differentiate a good surgeon and uh, a mediocre surgeon is a glenoid exposure and it's really crucial and we are not accurately producing glenoid version and inclination regardless of how good we think we are there is a bit of variation and so in order to achieve better glenoid implantation you have to aim for more accurate navigation system. We did a study looking at navigation and total knee replacement, and it's not still not as uh, accurate as what you need to do. So the there are a lot of navigation systems, a lot of uh, bespoke jigs, all companies do them now. Eyeballing might not be enough, and we can do better with today's technology. We, we can improve our intraoperative view uh, because our approaches to the glenoid would not allow us that view. That view is really hard, but you can achieve it. Uh, the problem is we find it difficult to understand what we cannot see. If you cannot see the axis, or that's why I tend to do the ellipse method as per the paper I've shown you earlier, we cannot quantify or execute our correction. And, and there is some sort of guessing in there. So if you can see navigation might be helpful. There are, uh, now newer models of virtual reality. We are uh, working with other companies in order to achieve a better virtual reality that would enable us. Uh, these are actually, uh, start, this is by Wright Medica. It's a very good uh, system popularized in Harvard and Mayo Clinic. And I've seen it. it's really an amazing system that would enable you to plan your surgery better. So, uh, Finally, is it worth investing? Yes, there is still more work to do. Finally, to summarize, uh, what Gramont made in the 1985 has now made 
us to more and more reverse shoulder replacements. If you look at national joint registries, the numbers has doubled in the UK and Europe and the whole world over the last decades. Decade. We still have to work more and look into it more and spend some time to improve the outcomes of our patients. And uh, knowing your implant and do plan it would enable you to achieve better outcomes. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Mohammed Imam, for this marvelous talk. حضرتك بصراحة ما سبتش حاجة في الشولدر أرثروبلاستي أبدا. Yeah, that's right. ربنا يديك الصحة فن. يعني محاضرة رائعة بصراحة فن. الله يخليك فن. Thank you so much, sir. Doctor Karim, you are the moderator with Professor Mohammed. Thanks, Doctor Mohammed. It was a very updated, precious talk. It covered almost all all questions and debatable points. Uh, but we have a few questions here. Of course. And waiting uh, for our attendees. First question is uh, from uh, Dr. Wail Abu Zaid. Uh, is there a restrained type implant for reversed shoulder um, arthroplasty that could solve the stability problems and the deltoid weakness? So, still, uh, you know, there are part of the models that we I presented uh, earlier actually was looking, trying to do a, a constrained type of implant. The problem is by doing so, you create massive uh, stress forces on the base plate. And this is why base plate failure was a huge problem in this, uh, uh, in this earlier processes. And the understanding, so we have to understand now the balance. So with the toy weakness, the only options that you know and actually it's a very technical uh, options that might not be successful in most cases would be aiming for uh, you know like the parachute uh, technique of tendon transfers and so but i said that's why i said you know i still think deltoid weakness or axial nerve palsy is a contraindication to do a short reverse shoulder replacement and the cases uh, dr Muhammad, you go for uh, arthrodesis or, or what in case of axillary nerve palsy. Yes. How many arthrodesis have you seen? Of the shoulder? Never. <laughs> I've seen two. One of them was in Zurich. One of them I did with another consultant colleague. It's mainly for instability. I don't think, you know, arthrodesis is a very painful procedure to do in shoulders. And uh, I wouldn't opt for that. Uh, if the patient has pain and uh, so we can do other problems like suprascapular nerve uh, ablation or injections or so. So this is, uh, you know, this patient is a challenging patient. I wouldn't actually opt for arthrodesis for them. Although it is on paper, it is a valid option. Uh, what about the era of tendon transfer around shoulder? So, you know what I tend to do, actually, I think tendon transfers uh, about, the point is as yet, the evidence does not really support doing another procedure. Of tendon transfer, but I, personally, I do the lepascopy. So moving the latissimus dorsi from here to the other side while doing the reverse shoulder replacement, it takes 20, 15 minutes to do it if you're doing it, especially in patients who cannot maintain external rotation. So for these patients, actually, uh, for these patients, I would opt for uh, who cannot do the Herbert Meyer. Uh, so sorry, the external rotation test, I would consider uh, doing uh, lepascopy transfer. Uh, uh, do you go uh, for subscapularis repair routinely in, uh, in cases of uh, reverse shoulder or uh, you uh, skip this step? It is a very good question. So uh, in all meetings, that question keeps coming out. You know, some surgeons would say, no, I don't repair it. Others like Christian Gerber will repair it. Uh, I personally, if I can repair it, I repair it. But if it's, uh, it's, if it's so frail or degenerate or not weak, I don't repair it. Uh, so I tend to repair it just as a sort of protect, uh, like uh, soft, another layer of envelope, soft tissue, soft uh, envelope uh, around the shoulder. But it is a very debatable question. And personally, I think there is no right answer to that question because I've looked at, you know, I, I do routine uh, scores for all my patients. And I have noticed that, uh, you know, there is no significant difference between those who have I repaired subscap or not. Uh, I had a question. Uh, you, you, you already answered it, but I, uh, I'd like to uh, spot it more. It's about uh, external rotator uh, the deficiency in patients with massive rotator cuff tear uh, that include uh, uh, inferspinatus and the tears minor. 
reverse shoulder can't uh, regain the external rotation uh, range of motion. It may regain internal rotation by anterior fibers of deltoid and uh, already abduction. But external rotation uh, still the point that uh, reverse shoulder can't uh, retain it again. Uh, so you, uh, you, you answered it by uh, do tendon transfer the tissue side. Yes. Uh, yeah, it's a point. It's actually, so I think, you know, excursion wise, if I have someone with irreversible cuff, no arthritis, I will opt for lower trapezius transfer because of excursion. But latissimus dorsi, which was uh, proposed by Gerber, it's because in your approach, you know, you can see the latissimus dorsi. Easier. Right? It's easier. And it's so easy. It takes 10 minutes mm. to do it. So, but it, you need just proper physio after having this tendon transfer in order, physiotherapist who know what they are doing in order to regain full function. Or not full function, yes. Mm. And you know, it's important bit that you have to tell all your patients, and that's what I do. You know, the main indication for, uh, the main indication for shoulder replacement, actually total shoulder, total joint replacement is pain. So I do not promise them increased range of motion. It comes as a bonus, but actually with any shoulder or with any joint replacement, the main, out, uh, the main indication pain. is actually pain relief. Pain. Another question, Dr. Mohammed. Uh, oh. In case of uh, glenoid, uh, glenoid retroversion, glenoid retroversion, well, we may go for uh, excessive reaming or may go for uh, bone grafting. Uh, is there, a, uh, is this a certain degree of retroversion at which we can't uh, correct it by over reaming? Uh, so it depends on what sort. So it depends what type of Walsh uh grading uh, you have there as well and so what sort of defect you have and that's why ct is important so you can do the reaming uh, technique it's really important it's really good uh, some um, companies have uh, you know different which was uh, ian trail i worked with him at writington and he he designed uh, uh, base plates and the metal augments for uh, the tonier one depending on how much uh, defect and how much retroversion you have, uh, you know, the, it, it is a challenging bit. And that's why you have to look at uh, CT scan prior to doing uh, your uh, shoulder, uh, uh, sorry, prior to do your uh, shoulder, uh, uh, prior to doing your shoulder replacement, because uh, it gives you an idea about uh, what sort of uh, problems you can anticipate and how you can manage this. So there are different options uh, how to uh, manage uh, this uh, problem. And that's why multiple manufacturers have developed different uh, glenoid designs over the past decade. You have oval, circular, uh, backside geometries, the type of fixation, all these can enable you to correct to some extent the retroversion and implant uh, your implant using different base plates uh, in order to achieve, to correct the retroversion to some extent. Uh, we had uh, a short conversation before uh, the talk about uh, trauma cases. Trauma yes. cases. Yes. Patients with complex proximal humeral fractures, uh, still many questions about going for hemiarthroplasty, reversed shoulder from the start. Uh, what is guidelines? What is uh, the... so? I, I what I've noticed, and that's what we have. And now you know because of COVID, and we are at the peak of the pandemic. You know, the shoulder. I, I the shoulder. You know, the, next week I'm doing two mainly for trauma. So we're only doing reverse shoulder replacement for trauma as we stop doing elective work. Uh, we stopped doing that actually from early January because of uh, what's happening in the UK COVID right? And uh, personally. I would opt for a, uh, a reverse shoulder replacement. We know that uh, the, the outcomes of uh, hemi are, so as you know, the main, the main predictor for outcome here is healing of the tuberosities. That's an important factor. And you can aim for a repair of the tuberosities in any metal work, uh, in any processes. It's fine, there are different concepts and you can achieve that in both. But with hemis, you have progressive cuff failure and the hemis will cause impingement and pain and will fail eventually. And actually looking at patients that have hemi after a reversal, after a, 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 a hemi for a proximal humerus fracture, I think you know the only indication for hemi arthroplasty in my mind would be for young patients with 
unreconstructable uh, proximal humerus. It's still a valid option uh, if you can achieve healing of the prostate and you can achieve uh, uh, reducing the head in the uh, in the right position with uh, the re and the restoration of the uh, center of rotation. But it's easier to do a reverse. So that's actually let it take that way. So and actually, uh, you know, the other thing also. The majority of this uh, multi-fragmentary proximal humeral fraction happen in osteoporotic bone. So it's all, all the elderly population. So why do two procedures? If you can do one, that would help them for many years to come. The same actually now, if I have someone who's 75 years old or 80 years old, you know, I have uh, um, one of my colleagues in the same unit uh, who would uh, still do an anatomic, but I personally have a very low threshold to go for a reverse for them if they are 75 or 80 years old and many surgeons do the same as well because that will give these patients a normal, semi-normal shoulder for many years to come and you don't have to revise it again. I mentioned in, uh, that the indication uh, uh, certainly for you for, is, uh, for using shoulder hemorrhage plus is young age. Yes. Uh, may you uh, detect a certain age, you know, 40, 50? It, it depends. What does it mean by young age? Yes, it's a very, very, oh. very, uh, very good. Or it is MRI, MRI dependent uh, so about the states. Mm -hmm. There is two things here. There is a physiological age of the patient. So you can have someone who's 35 years old with advanced hemophilia. I'll manage them as 75 years old. On the other side, you know, you have seven, someone who's 60 years old. So I personally, for me, young age, so between, between 50 and 60 is borderline. Younger than 50 is young age, and the older than 60, I would opt, I would say 60 is the differentiating. But, but you know, you have someone who's 60 years old and they sit on the sofa all day long, drinking alcohol and smoking, and someone who's 80 who plays 18 hole golf um, game, uh, which involves walking for four hours. So it's actually all about physiologic age and patient demographics. And that, you know, and that we, uh, I, we should apply to everything else. We should aim for uh, bespoke individualized treatment for everyone we treat. Uh, MRI is, um, MRI is uh, also an important factor, especially to define fatty infiltration of the cuff and so on. Epileptic patients. No. Oh. So that's also a challenging situation we always have. So it's a, I, I've mentioned briefly in uh, the presentation, I had, uh, so with epileptic patients, the problem is, you know, they have involuntary contraction with the internal rotators, which is stronger than the external rotators contracting at the same time. And that's why it can cause posterior dislocation. And the problem is putting metal work in them without proper control of epilepsy is a risk because, you know, you cannot, you know, your implant, however good you did, still can dislocate. And so for them, what we tend to do and what I tend to do, and that's what I did for the last patient I've done, I was unfortunately, actually there are two, what I did anatomic for uh, him, and he had an, uh, a dislocation that was missed, posterior dislocation, and so I saw him about three months down the line and there was head deformed and it was unsalvageable. So I opted for anatomic. I referred to a neurologist and I made sure he had no fits for six months before offering him the shoulder replacement. And I've done it like 18 months, uh, about six months ago and I haven't heard from him so now, uh, till now, so it's good news till now. Another question from Dr. Mustafa Arawi. In case of uh, recurrent failure of uh, reverse shoulder or surgery, yeah. uh, do you do bio uh, reverse shoulder or hemi arthroplasty? It depends. It depends. So one thing, uh, so hemi arthroplasty can be a salvageable, uh, which we we with that paper we published in uh, Core, we looked at the different aspects like failed. One 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 important factor is why this shoulder keep falling, failing. Sorry, uh, is it because of infection? That's a completely different scenario. Is it? And I, I actually have to assess the. Uh, 
the bone defect and uh, the deficiencies like what we do for hips as uh, there is uh, we actually i had a lot of pictures about prom uh, one of the custom made processes so you can use custom made processes to reconstruct this and we've done that before a hemiarthroplasty or a bipolar with large head which would be a salvageable option if you can do another reverse with blood bone graft or bone grafting of the glenoid site that also could be another option so it's all dependent on the patient there is no algorithms that I can tell you but of course my main uh, uh, obsession is to exclude infection I don't mind doing a quick shoulder arthroscopy taking samples making sure uh, we send them there is a new uh, biomarker called procalcitonin which they use an ITU which can also be indicative of bacterial infection we are actually aiming to start studying that but I think you know it's uh, it's all a bespoke scenario towards different pathologies uh, for Dr. Mohammed Imam, what is your preferred method uh, to avoid notching? Uh, you go for a glenoid component, humeral component. Now I'm doing actually, So it is, as I said, and I try to summarize it because I think this is a misunderstood uh, concept. I'll aim for in putting my uh, head, my glim sphere a bit inferior, which I'll do all the time. The other, and actually use, I use eccentric as well, uh, one, uh, and uh, inferior tilt would be really important as well. Assessing uh, with CT scan prior to that, I go for uh, lateralization personally. I've, I use two, uh, two implants. I can, aim, I can sometimes I'll use, now I use humoral lateralization. I use actually glenoid lateralization or both in order to avoid uh, notching. And what I think, you know, all these technical tips I heard and I've seen over the years, and now I'm using it. and. I think, you know, we're seeing less and less of this now. But still a big, a big problem, we cannot deny it. شكرا دكتور محمد يعني احنا مستمتعين مع حضرتك ومش عايزين يعني بجد ان مش عارفين نوقف اسئله فاحنا بنشكر حضرتك جدا دكتور محمد for for lateralization if the if the graft is dead didn't taken what what do you do sir Yes, so it's a very, very good uh, question. You, so actually it happened twice in uh, two BIRSAs we've done. We waited on one of them and the patient was asymptomatic, so we opted for watchful observation. The other options that you can do if the patient is symptomatic or the base plate fails because you know, the graft is still there, but you're aiming with long screws as well. And so there is a good purchase of the base plate there. But the other patient, it was, uh, there was base plate failure and uh, we revised it with another biopsy, which has been taken this time. And actually the other options that you can use is have a metal packed uh, glenoid if there is a defect. في النهاية احنا بنشكر حضرتك يا فندم شكر جزيل على المحاضرة الرائعة والدسكشن الأكثر من رائع يعني يعني محاضرة رائعة أوقفها دسكشن رائع بصراحة طبعا يعني تشريف حضرتك معنا شرف كبير لنا دكتور محمد بيه النهاردة Thank you so much sir ونعمل ان نشوف مع حضرتك معنا كتير يا فندم إن شاء الله يشرفني في أي وقت و... والمجهود اللي حضرتك بتعملوه فعلا علم ينتفع به وفعلا حاجات مفيدة جدا و... وبتأتراك ناس إمننت في كل التخصصات ما شاء الله موجود حضرتك أستاذ محاضر Thank you so much many thanks to Professor Mohamed Imam